This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. I've preached and taught several times on the sayings of Christ from the cross, but I'm not sure that I've ever studied other sayings, what we might call the sayings from the cursed. In Matthew 27 and verse 40, the mockers said, If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. They also said in Matthew 27 and verse 43, He trusts in God. Let Him deliver Him now. If he takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the Son of God. In Matthew 27, they say in verse 47 and 49, This man is calling for Elijah. Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. In Matthew 27 and verse 54, the centurion stood at the foot of the cross and he said, Truly this was the Son of God. One of the male factors said in Mark 15 and verse 30, Save yourself and come down from the cross. In Luke 23 verse 36, they say, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And then the thief said in Luke 23 verse 39, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. In John 19 and verse 24, the soldiers talking about Jesus' tunic said, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. And so some sneered, others mocked. There was blaspheming and laughing and sneering. There were godless soldiers, corrupt rulers, rabble in the crowd, and even dying men. But one idea they kept repeating was that of doubt that Jesus could save himself. They challenged him and taunted him to come down from the cross and to prove himself. It must have been rather difficult for people to look up at the cross where Jesus hung, a man bloodied and beaten, his flesh from head to toe ripped by scourging, life-size but no more, quiet and unresisting, and, and to see one who could save himself. But what blinded their view and kept them from seeing one who could save himself? Was it the same thing that probably caused all of his disciples, even those who stood at the foot of that cross, from truly believing that Jesus possessed endless power even at that very moment? Is it the same thing that keeps us from seeing what our Lord is capable of in our lives? In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, Paul reminds us that as Christians, we walk by faith and not by sight. That is the ideal, but in our ordeal, it's not always the real. The lesson title, Could He Not Save Himself, comes from Mark chapter 15 and verse 31. But if we'll start back at verse 29, notice what the text says. Those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with Him were also insulting Him. In Mark 15 and verse 31, where we read, He saved Himself, He cannot save Himself, can also be translated, Can He not save Himself? If we believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, we know without a doubt that Christ could have saved Himself. He had the power and He had the ability to end the cross experience as easily as He created the whole world in Colossians 1, 16 and 17. The writer of Hebrews gives this glowing testimony of Jesus. God, who at sundry times and in divers' manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds, 
who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Hebrews 1, 1 1-4. Jesus was not restricted or limited by man. He was not restricted by man's intellect or man's power or man's schemes. But let's examine our question very carefully. Could Jesus have saved himself? In a word, I would answer no. Christ could not have saved himself from death on the cross. I hope for the next few moments you'll allow me to prove this answer. Number one, Christ could not have saved himself if he was to demonstrate his love. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 5 says, And hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, and yet for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Paul speaks of Jesus' death on the cross, and he says, He loved me, and He gave Himself for me. Galatians 2 and verse 20. Christ Himself had said this, There's no greater love that anyone has than this, than a man lays down his life for his friends. John 15 and verse 13. William Barclay says that Jesus came to tell men of the love of God. More, he was himself the incarnate love of God. And if Jesus had refused the cross... If in the end he had come down from the cross, it would have meant that there was a limit to the love of God. That there was something which the love of God was not prepared to suffer for men. That there was a line beyond which the love of God would not go. When we look at the cross, Jesus is saying to us, God loves you like that. With a love that is limitless. A love that will bear every suffering that earth has to offer for you. That Jesus could exhibit that love in the face of such unloving provocation is absolutely amazing. Jesus had already come so far and had done so much on our behalf. He lowered himself to come to this earth as a man. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 through 11. And while he was here... He suffered a large number of privations and he endured a great many sacrifices. In Matthew 8 and verse 20, Jesus said, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Matthew 8, 20. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might be rich. You know, grace like love is a very large and unique concept, but the two are so closely tied. Love is the motivation for grace. And grace is the expression of love. Jesus repeatedly showed his determination to fulfill that love at the cross. He had allowed himself to be arrested and tried and scourged and nailed to a cross. Why, after demonstrating that degree of love through that self-sacrifice that he made, would he have come down from the cross? Christ could not have saved himself if he was going to demonstrate his love. But then second, Christ could not have saved himself if he was to demonstrate his power. Augustine cites Isaiah's terminology in Isaiah 53 that Christ was without comeliness to make this point. He said, Such he appeared on the cross. Such when crowned with thorns did he exhibit himself, disfigured and without comeliness, as if he had lost his power, as if not the Son of God. 
such did he seem to the blind. Perhaps the greatest irony of Calvary is that Christ demonstrated his power by not exercising his power to free himself from the cross. He certainly must have appeared powerless, hanging there, beaten and bloodied by Roman soldiers. Those who witnessed his crucifixion made the mistake of thinking that what he did not do, he could not do. Jesus did not free himself from the cross because he did not wish to do so. That is perhaps the ultimate demonstration of power, not using it when you would most like to. It's only by staying on Calvary that Christ could demonstrate His power. Only by staying on the Christ, a cross rather, could Christ demonstrate His power over sin. In John 19, verse 10 and 11, we read that Pilate said to Jesus, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? And Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. By hanging on the Christ, a cross, rather, Christ demonstrated His power over death. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, Jesus, after the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension to heaven, would say, I am He who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. But also we see that Christ demonstrated His power over the cross by staying there. And by staying there, He showed His power over the devil. Hebrews 2.14 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, He Himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Paul said, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross is a demonstration of the power of God. The cross itself and Jesus hanging there showed his power. If the message of the cross is God's power, so must the moments that Jesus have hung there be power of God. Christ could have easily answered their challenge, but to do so would have been to throw away a catastrophic portion of His unlimited power. Could Christ have saved Himself? Not if He was going to show His power. Then third, Christ could not have saved Himself if He was to show His submission. We don't live in a world in which the idea of submitting to authority is popular. But we cannot understand Jesus in the cross, much less why He stayed there without it. In His public ministry, Jesus said, My meat or my food is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. John chapter 4 and verse 34. And just a little later after this, Jesus would say again, in John chapter 6 beginning at verse 38, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. This is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. Even when that meant facing his imminent, torturous death, he could say this to his father. Through the agony of preparing to die, he says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Luke 22, verse 42. He carried his submissive nature all the way to the cross of Calvary. The Hebrews writer looks back on this and says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. Where, by the way? On the cross. 
And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 7 through 9. Jesus teaches us the perfect example of submission by refusing to save himself. C.E.W. Doris said, That mob present for Christ's crucifixion cannot understand but that Christ's first and supreme desire was to be saved from the suffering that he was undergoing. And while the flesh drew back from the torture, his soul sincerely desired to do his Father's will and to suffer that men might be saved. You see, Jesus was submitting to a plan that was in God's mind from eternity. Ephesians 3, 9-11 refers to this as the eternal purpose which God purposed before time began that we could be saved, that the mystery might be known through the church, the manifold wisdom of God. And while I guess I can grasp to some degree the logic of God's justice demanding a perfect sacrifice for the sins that you and I could never pay for, and that Christ's coming as all God and all man was that perfect sacrifice, I cannot fathom why God would do it and why Christ would submit to it especially is it baffling when we consider that it was for us, for our benefit, not His. And as a side note, how can anyone argue with God's plan of salvation or quibble with what God has asked us to do to receive His grace? In the face of what Jesus went through, what would we not do that He wants us to do? But for that matter, why would I ever argue with God or refuse to submit to His will for my life in any matter, great or small, when I look at Jesus' example of submission for my sake. For Jesus to have risen to the chief priest's challenge would mean that Christ would have thrown off His subjection to the headship of His Father. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, Paul would say, But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. He understood the central part that he had to play in the Father's plan for our redemption. In Romans 5 and verse 19, the Bible says, For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one the many will be made righteous. Could Jesus have come down from that cross? Jesus could not have saved himself if he was going to demonstrate his submission to the Father's will, which he said he was committed to. But then finally, Christ could not have saved himself if he was to keep his word. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that Jesus lived a sinless life which is why that he could be the suitable substitute for our sins, to be a lamb without spot or blemish, 1 Peter 1, verse 19. Here's what the Bible said. In 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 21, he knew no sin. In Hebrews 4, and verse 15, he is without sin. Hebrews chapter 7, and verse 26, he is holy, innocent, undefiled, and separated from sinners. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 22, he committed no sin. In 1 John 3 and verse 5, in him there is no sin. Not only does that mean that Christ never sinned with his body, but he never sinned with his tongue. There was no deceit found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2, 22, and he made it clear repeatedly throughout his ministry that he was heading for the cross. He was going to die. After Jesus taught about the church that he was going to build, and Acts 20 verse 28 reminds us that he bought that church with his blood, we read this in Matthew 16, 21. It says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and to be killed and to be raised up on the third day. He had told his disciples in John 3:14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. 
In Matthew 20, verse 17, beginning, it says, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Though his disciples, much less his enemies, could not understand what Christ was telling them, Jesus was binding himself by his own prophetic word. Godless hands nailed Jesus to the cross and put him to death, Acts 2 verse 23. But Christ had the power to prevent or to stop it from ha- happening. But the perfect word of deity made it impossible for Christ to come down. Hebrews 6.18 says it's impossible for God to lie. Let me mention one other thing. Christ could not have saved himself if he was to save others. In Linsky's comments on Mark 15.32, he says, The truth that Jesus does and will use his power in his own far more glorious way is hidden from the chief priest. These mockers knew only power that's used in self-interest. Of grace and mercy that cares only for others at the complete expense of self, they knew nothing. If Jesus descends from the cross, our only glimmer of hope to escape eternal pain and destruction and have eternal life is extinguished like a a hurricane force wind strikes the flame on the tiniest candle. Well put. The mockers challenging Jesus ironically acknowledge that he had power, that he had saved others. They attributed his power to Satan in Luke eleven eighteen, 18, but they had seen his miracles. How many of their family members and acquaintances and loved ones had Christ healed and helped? And even as he bled and died before their very eyes, he was saving them as they condemned him. In John 12, 47, Jesus said, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Luke 24 and verse 26 says that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer these things. Even corrupt Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest that year, said in John 11 and verse 50, It is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Now, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Christ was going to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. And so from that day on, they planned together to kill him. But Jesus nullifies all prophecy. And the whole doctrine of atonement for our sins is destroyed if Jesus comes down from the cross. Jesus could not have saved himself if he was going to save you and me. Yes, Jesus could have saved himself, of course and crushed every opponent, every doubter, every mocker, and every sinner with just a thought. But praise God that he didn't. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25 says that Jesus, our Lord, was delivered over because of our transgression and was raised because of our justification. Jesus lived a lifetime in the looming shadow of the cross. He was conceived for Calvary. He was born to die. He was begotten for burial and reared for the resurrection, as Alan Webster would say. He spent three decades on death row, aware of the agony that weighted his body and the anguish that would tear his heart. And he could have stopped. He stopped all of it. But for his own perfect nature and character, Thank God for that. Jesus could not have come down from the cross if he wanted to show his love for us. If he wanted to show his power. If he was going to show his subjection, his uh, submission to the Father's will. 
if He was going to atone for our sins and save us, no, Jesus had to, to keep the word that He had, had given. So Jesus could not have saved Himself if He was going to be sinless in word. But thank God that Jesus did not come down from the cross. Because Christ did not come down from the cross, here's what it means. He died and was buried and was, rose, and, and was risen again. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 8, the Bible talks about the need that we have to be baptized. And do you know what we do when we're baptized? We unite with Christ and in His death. We join Christ in dying and being buried and being raised again. Only we die to self and to sin. We bury that old man of sin in baptism. And then we rise to walk in newness of life. We already know that Jesus didn't come down from the cross but will you allow yourself to be put up on the cross of self-denial? To allow yourself to, to be subject to the power and the authority of Jesus? Will you allow yourself to, to submit to the Father's will? To show your love and your gratitude for what He did by giving your life to Him? Let me encourage you to do that and let us know if we can assist you in any way.